Our guest today is Jim O'Brien. Jim has been a Wyckoff student for 45 years. He took the course on the GI Bill after returning from Southeast Asia. In uh, 2002, Jim joined forces with Craig Schroeder and Gary Schubert, who owned the original Stock Market Institute. He designed the Wyckoff Stock Market Institute website and then developed the online Wyckoff charting service that encompassed all the Wyckoff tools. In addition, he wrote daily and weekly market reports that gave Wyckoff students a strong understanding of present market conditions and future direction. Last year, Jim completed an updated version of the Wyckoff course entitled Wyckoff Strategies and Techniques, Finding and Trading Winning Stocks. His topic today is Wyckoff Strategies and Techniques and how to use them. Jim, welcome, and thanks for being here with us today. Ron, thank you very much, and thank you for using the entire first paragraph of my presentation. Great job. <laughs> did it much better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. As, I, as Ron has mentioned, my name is Jim O'Brien, and I've been a Wyckoff student since 1971. Um, today, I'd like to spend the next 60 minutes or so presenting a primer on how these wonderful strategies and techniques help Wyckoff students succeed in stock market. I'd like to discuss, and if I can get this slide to move, there we go, um, what is Wyckoff? A little bit of the history of Richard D. Wyckoff and the Stock Market Institute. What Wyckoff isn't? Basic Wyckoff concepts that all center around the continuing battle between supply and demand. In that, we will cover buying and selling climaxes, accumulation and its ending action, distribution and its ending action, market trends, and then a little bit on how to find the winners and some insights into Wyckoff trading guidelines that I think will be helpful to everyone. They certainly were helpful to me, and I have enjoyed using the Wyckoff, I'm using the Wyckoff strategies for the last 46 years. I am a Wyckoff purist. I am only interested in Wyckoff. I only follow those strategies and techniques, and that's what I do. And at 74, I am happily retired with my Wyckoff profits. Please feel free to answer any, ask any questions, and I'll try to get you the answer. In addition, I've created a new forum on my website, and my website is WyckoffStockMarketInstitute.com, just for this webinar. This is a permanent forum, so you can ask your questions at any time, whether it's today, whether it's next week, whether it's next month, it will be there for you. I've also written the ebook that Ron mentioned, which is really an updated version of the basic course entitled Wyckoff Strategies and Techniques, How to Find and Trade Winning Stocks. This seminar is an overview of the materials found in the book. It's available on my website. Anyone who purchases the book will also receive it in an audio format with its own set of charts. Now let's get to work. What is Wyckoff? During the first third of the 20th century, Richard D. Wyckoff, who lived from 1873 to 1934, was an extremely successful trader in stocks, bonds, and commodities. As his wealth increased, he turned his attention to understanding how the financial markets behaved and the forces that made them move. Wyckoff believed that markets are made in the minds of men and that all the fluctuations in the market should be studied as if they were the result of one man's operation. And he called this his composite man theory. He also felt that the best way to make money in the financial markets was to identify which stocks had attracted professional interest. Then, using his technical trading strategies and techniques, 
He would wait until he saw the professionals were ready to move a stock, bond, or commodity. This was the time to take a position. In Wyckoff's day, the professionals were the great speculators like Jay Gould, Leslie, Jesse Livermore, and James Keene. Today, they are the hedge fund, mutual fund, and pension fund operators. The players may have changed, but Wyckoff's strategies and techniques work as well as they did 100 years ago. And that's what's so amazing about Wyckoff. Everything's different in the market today. But if you follow the Wyckoff strategies, they're, they were just as successful right now and as successful in 2017 as they were back in 1920. Richard D. Wyckoff was the very first stock trader to include volume studies in his stock market analysis. He combined his knowledge of stock market volume with the price studies that he developed that were developed by his good friend Charles Dow. In fact, Wyckoff and Dow had lunch once a week and shared their ideas about the markets. The results were the Wyckoff market stock market strategies and techniques that are well detailed in the two courses produced and distributed by Stock Market Institute. Again, through my website, WyckoffStockMarketInstitute.com. Most importantly, Mr. Wyckoff's concepts remain as valid today as they did in the first third of the 20th century. In fact, the strategies work as well today as they did 100 years ago is a testament to their validity in our different and ever-changing markets. That's what Wyckoff is. What Wyckoff isn't, and this is kind of important, it is not an easy, automatic method to make money in the stock market. Too many people who fall prey to those offering automatic buy and sell signals often lose a fair amount of their capital. I would suggest that market knowledge is not automated or mechanical, but more of an art form. It's actually about developing a trading action plan, getting to know the stocks you plan to buy, learning their individual characteristics, and watching for important Wyckoff market indicators. Perhaps you've already heard Wyckoff terms, like buying and selling climaxes, springs, upthrust, signs of strength and weakness, and last points of support and supply. We will certainly get into these in more detail in just a few minutes. These are important Wyckoff indicators, but they should be treated like mechanical signals. They should not be treated like mechanical signals, excuse me. They are simply signposts that tell the Wyckoff student that a potential opportunity lies ahead. It's your responsibility to then analyze the stock's activity and see if the price and volume relationships warrant taking a position. Trading action includes why the position was taken and what the stock will do in the immediate future, an objective area where a successful trade can be terminated and profits taken, a specific price where the trade should be closed if the stock does not behave as expected. I've learned many of these lessons through trial and error, and as, as a result have paid a bit of tuition to what I call the University of Wall Street. I hope this webinar helps reduce yours. At first blush, the financial markets appear to be a disorganized and uncontrolled mass of seemingly unrelated activity. Expert pundits will offer reasons as to why markets rallied or reacted. Sometimes the given explanation for a market rally appears a few weeks later to justify a reaction. That makes no sense, but it happens. However, within these seemingly random fluctuations, there is a logic to the chaos. The question is, how does one make sense out of mayhem? The answer is in the most fundamental of all trading concepts. The stock market is the last great bastion of free market capitalism. It functions solely on the laws of supply and demand. When more shares are bought than sold, the stock goes up. When more shares are sold than bought, the stock goes down. It's that simple. The battle between supply and demand is being fought every single second of every market day. Every market move is comprised of a series of smaller fluctuations, which in turn are based on the relationship of the price and its associated volume. 
Those smaller moves occur throughout the trading day, and they are called waves. Like ocean waves, market fluctuations have powerful underlying forces that transform seemingly quiet and peaceful swells into powerful giants that can distinctly alter the trading landscape. One secret in trading the stock market is learning to observe the minor wave fluctuations and understand the relationships between price and volume. This knowledge helps the trader prepare for future moves in either direction. Successful stock traders combine that basic understanding with the Wyckoff strategies and techniques to better understand how the markets and their individual stocks are performing and, more importantly, how they can be expected to act in the future. Tracking each intraday wave's volume is extremely important. Many market analysts believe that if a stock advances during the day, all the volume should be regarded as demand or up volume. Conversely, all reactions should consist of down volume. Wyckoff down volume certainly can be demand. This important fact really helps us begin to look at the stock market on a daily basis and see where the supply and where the demand really are. But even if the intraday information is not available, the end of day volume can provide clues to identifying the amount of demand or supply present in the stock or index. Demand is considered to be present if the stock rallies on increased price spread and increased volume, or it reacts on decreased price spread and increased volume. Supply is present if the stock reacts on increased price spread and increased volume, or rallies on decreased price spread and increased volume. If a stock rallies on reduced price spread and reduced volume, it is considered to have a lack of demand. There is also a lack of demand on a reaction that has increased price spread but decreased volume. And finally, if a stock reacts on reduced price spread and reduced volume, it is considered to have a lack of supply. There is also a lack of supply if a stock rallies on increased price spread but reduced volume. By looking at these daily numbers or as they appear on the vertical line chart, you can sort of get a sense to where the supply and demand is. For example, today, okay, and over the last few weeks, the S&P 500 has been reacting. It's reacting on strong supply. It's not, it wants to rally, but it's not able to. That's because it still has to take in supply. Those people that want to take a long position in the market need to wait for that supply to dry up. And that, can be, that is being told to us as we watch the market every single day. Now, how does this apply to the real world? Since Wyckoff strategies attempt to emulate the professional trader, let's look at how they create campaigns. These campaigns are designed to drive stocks higher during a bull market or lower in a bear market. Each campaign begins with stopping a trend. That is called climactic action. A selling climax stops the trend to the downside. A buying climax stops the trend to the upside. Once a trend is stopped, the stock moves sideways during a period of accumulation or distribution. This allows the trader to purchase large, the professional I should say, to purchase large quantities of stock or short large quantities of stock in a relatively narrow price range. These are called trading ranges. Finally, there is ending action. That is when a stock finishes its up sideways move and makes a definitive effort either up or down. This would be accumulation, up after accumulation or down after distribution. So well, let's take a look at this and start with accumulation. This is a basic chart of a nice little period of accumulation. During accumulation, the professionals are buying stocks from the public who for many reasons have decided to sell. The most important thing is that the stock is moving from weak hands into strong hands. 
the professionals are trying to take over the stock and control its, its action. This is the diagram of accumulation that presents preliminary support, a selling climax, a trading range, and finally the ending action. The diagram is divided into five sections. As a stock reacts, there is more selling than buying. Supply has taken over the market, and this is shown in section one of the chart. The selling noticeably increases during the preliminary support, which is an early indicator that the trend could be coming to an end, and that's shown here at point one. and then the selling climax at point two. The climactic action continues to suggest that the stock is being liquidated and supply is in total control because there is very widespread and high volume right in this area. Instead, the reaction is ending and demand is coming back into the stock. The professionals are buying to stop the downtrend. The climactic action completes section one on the accumulation chart. Section two begins with a distinct change in character. Because so much of the stock has been liquidated, little supply remains. This shortage of stock for sale causes a bounce, which is known as an automatic rally. And that, as you can see right here, is point three on the chart. While the bottom of the selling climax may signal the end of the reaction, it must be confirmed. This confirmation is in a successful secondary test, which is shown at point, as point four. The reaction to a successful secondary test needs to be on narrower price spread and lower volume than the selling climax. It also needs to end at a higher level than the selling climax. Once there is a successful secondary test, the end of the down move is confirmed and the stock can begin to move sideways and begin a trading range. Just an aside, if this secondary test moves below the climactic action at number two, the selling climax at point two, the secondary test needs to be repeated until we can be confirmed that the trend has stopped. But once the stopping auction is completed, the stock begins to move sideways to build a cause for its next move. It's interesting to note that the trading range's horizontal cause often equals the markup move that comes at the end of the trading range. It's sort of like building a building. The bigger and stronger your foundation is, the higher you can build the building. The destination or objective of the stock can be found on the point and figure chart, which we will cover briefly later on in this presentation. As the stock moves sideways, the professional is quietly buying and selling shares as the stock moves from weaker hands into stronger hands, and the amount of available stock is being reduced. Notice the resistance and support lines. They are not always straight horizontal lines, but are connected to the resistance and support points as the trading range develops. Notice here we started with the automatic rally at three, we stock met resistance at five, at seven, at nine, and then we draw a horizontal line back through. This, because it's the top of the trading range in accumulation, becomes very important. And while this is a resistance line, if the stock advances, as you can see, it will also become a very important support line. Down here at the bottom of the range, we see our support line drawn through 268 and then straight over to the right. These resistance and support lines, like other trend lines that we'll talk about the later, a little bit later, are very important in Wyckoff strategies and techniques. A spring is the last move to the downside that drives out the remaining weak holders and prepares the stock for an important advance. This is called the ending action. Ending action appears in three types of springs. They come in different sizes, a number one spring or shakeout, a number two or a number three spring. 
they differ in the distance the stock travels after it penetrates the support at the bottom of the trading range. The spring in this case is marked as number 10 on the chart. Notice how it drove through the support, scared people to think the reaction was going to continue, and then all of a sudden demand comes into the market and the stock surprisingly rallies. The number one spring is also known as a shakeout. During a number one spring, a stock reacts strongly through the support at the bottom of the trading range. This can even take a few days. Finally, demand comes in. The stock rallies strongly and returns to the trading range. Then it must react and put in a successful secondary test. The secondary test must hold above the bottom of the spring and be on relatively reduced price spread and volume. The most common spring is the number two spring. Here the stock definitively penetrates through the support but quickly encounters strong demand and rallies sharply. A number two spring also needs to be tested in the same way as a number one spring or a shakeout. The number three spring is much more subtle. There is only a slight penetration of the support. Demand quickly comes into the stock and it begins to rally. Number three springs do not need to be tested. The key to identifying a spring is after the support is penetrated, good demand comes into the market. If you can pick out this demand, it is certainly acceptable to buy on the spring. Otherwise, the white off trader should wait for a secondary test. The key to this, in my opinion, is when the stock goes through and is in a potential spring, watch it closely and wait for the demand to come into the market. Do not get involved in this stock or buy the stock until you see strong demand and the, string, and the spring starts to bounce and ready to go and ready to rally. Otherwise, it could go down and continue down and you will lose a fair amount of money. The next step is the sign of strength as the stock rallies to point number 12. After a successful spring and its secondary test, the ending action has completed. The stock's character has changed from trading range to ready to rally. The strong rally off the secondary test is known as a sign of strength. A sign of strength comes in two varieties, the sign of strength within a trading range and the more important sign of strength as the stock rallies through the top of the rating, trading range. In Wyckoff lore, this is called the jump across the creek. Robert Evans was a stock market institute icon who was known for his great stories and his unique way to present how stocks were behaving. One of his classic stories is about the jump across the creek. It involves a boy who was walking across a pasture on a beautiful summer afternoon and he comes to a creek. Well, the creek is rushing very fast and it's a little bit deep and the boy knows that he, there's no way that he can walk through the creek. He needs to jump over the creek. So he backs up a little bit and he runs toward the creek and he leaps in the air and he lands on the other side and he successfully has completed his mission. But he ends up past the creek. So he's all excited and all pleased with himself and he decides he's going to walk back to the creek and take a look at his accomplishment. And so he walks back to the creek, slowly and easily and gently, because he doesn't need to go back with all the force that he had jumping the creek. He looks and he sees at his, his handiwork. He's very pleased with himself, and then he continues his walk across the field. The jump across the creek is the sign of strength and walking slowly back to the edge of the creek, as we've done at number 13, is the last point of support. This walking back to the creek is done on reduced price spread and volume and holds at or above, it can cheat a little bit, but mostly at or above the resistance line drawn from the trading range. That's why this line becomes so important. Everything needs to be tested, as I just mentioned. 
and a successful reaction off the sign of strength is that last point of support. Again, and I said it before, but I want to emphasize it again, we need to see reduced price spread and volume because this is saying that supply is drying up. There isn't much more supply to stock to buy, and it's going to rally easily, okay, in its markup phase. The last phase is that markup phase as the stock rallies towards its final objective. I'd like to take a look at some springs in three different stocks. And what I have tried to do is, let me go back here. This is the perfect world. This shows a very nice example of a preliminary support, a selling climax, secondary test, a spring, a sign of strength, and a markup phase. Well, as I found out early in my career trading stocks, it don't come that way. And we have to be careful and look at real-world stocks. And when we're talking about and training in white cost strategies and techniques, I would much rather use real-world stocks that don't act perfectly, that don't present all these wonderful points as well. But we have to kind of find them. We have to root them out. And this is why I'm showing real-world stocks as opposed to perfect stocks that I could find somewhere else on, on the charting service. This is the stock of United Technologies. United Technologies came down to point A, and there was preliminary support. But it was a little bit different. There was a rally a test of preliminary support, another rally, and we didn't get the selling climax until point B. That's okay. I'm just watching what's happening. I'm saying what's going on. And then I realized that we had this high spread and price spread and volume right here at point B, and this was really the selling climax. We had an automatic rally and a secondary test to confirm that selling climax. I did not mark those on the chart, but they're here and they're here. The stock then continued to point C where it encountered resistance. It then began to react slowly. This is not a normal trading range, but it did encounter resistance here and here, and then we took it all the way across. The support line was drawn from the selling climax at point B. As United Technologies reacted, supply started to come into the market, and it rallied or reacted strongly through the support to point E. Then suddenly, demand came in. We normally might have expected that this would continue to react. It shouldn't be encountering demand here. This is where the stock should dramatically and quickly react. That didn't happen. When I saw demand here, this starts to scream number one spring. And look what happened. It went back worked its way through the trading range, and then rallied strongly to F, and then put in a secondary test at point G. The number one spring took 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 days. If you are trading this stock and you are looking to take a long position in this stock, you're just going to kind of watch it and see what happens. You're not going to get interested in it until you see the strong demand that took all of a sudden took it back into the trading range, and then we had a test on reduced volume at point G. The stock then moved quickly into point H as a sign of strength. Now, we would expect a backup to the creek at point I. But we really didn't see that, did we? We saw fairly wide price spread here and fairly wide price spread here, and volume was relatively high. This suggests that we really didn't have a backup to the edge of the creek or a last point of support at this point. Instead, the stock was going to continue to rally, and it moved up to point J, and then it backed up, and we had reduced price spread and volume. It held above the line, and then it was able to rally. By the way, if a position had been taken at point K at $50 a share, I believe United Technologies tripled in price 
after that. So there was a pretty good opportunity to the upside, but the Wyckoff trader had to be patient, look for the certain keys, and then learn when to take a position. And in my opinion, the only two places to take a position were at point G and at point K. Let's take a look at Raytheon. Raytheon is an example of a number two spring. Again, it came down to point capital A, and we had a buying climax, selling climax, automatic rally to point B, secondary test at point C, and then the trading range began to move sideways. We had resistance at D, E, and G. We had support at A. I have also done something here where I've tried to draw in both banks of the creek. Here's a, a good resistance point at point E, which becomes the far bank of the creek. And this is a resistance point at point G, becomes the near bank of the creek. It is perfectly reasonable for, on a backup for a stock to fall a little bit back into the creek. But if it gets more than halfway through, it's, fell, it's fallen back into the creek, and there's a good chance it will return, and the trading range will continue in a new and separate phase. Okay, so we've had the stock moving sideways. The ending action is point F. We see it's penetrated the support right here at point F, and then strong demand comes into the market, and it rallies to point G. It then reacts back toward point H for a secondary test. Again, I didn't show you a perfect secondary test. I wanted because you have to look at stock and try to find stuff and prove that it really was a successful secondary test. Notice the green bar right here at point H. It's hard to read, but if you look right where I have my cursor, that's where the stock opened. The stock opened and barely penetrated the demand on very low price spread and volume, and then rallied strongly, and here was the close. So the successful test was here. Supply was dried up, and demand came into the market intraday and drove the stock up. This is what made for a successful secondary test. Again, it didn't pretend it. It had the opportunity to penetrate through support. didn't do it. did it on fairly low volume, and then, boom, demand came in, and off it went. And it rallied all the way up to point I. Sign of strength jumped the creek. Isn't that terrific? But it backed up, and it backed up on relatively wide price spread and relatively high volume. Again, a bit of a problem. This was simply a resting area, and the sign of strength was not completed. It was completed at point K. Raytheon then reacted to point L. Look at the low price spread on point L. We finally saw right here right in this red line right here, reduce price spread, noticeably reduce volume, we had a perfect last point of support, and off Raytheon went. By the way, Raytheon is trading at a little over $175 a share. So by getting in at point L or getting in at point H on the spring would have brought the wake off trader some wonderful profits. The last spring is the number three spring. And this is shown on the JCPenney chart. The number three spring, as I mentioned, are very subtle. Just a slight move through the support line at the bottom of the trading range at point H. Again, we have, we could have had preliminary support here. Okay, we had a buying climax at point A, rally to point B, secondary test at point C. Then again, we have the resistance lines that form the resistance part of the trading range and the support line that forms the support part of the trading range or the bottom of the trading range. After successfully, so as it reacted, and it reacted slowly, 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 not made very dull, then it came down and slightly penetrated support at point H and then began to rally. Rallied to point I, put in a 
last point of support at point J, and then off it went. Now, this is a sign of strength. The reaction is on a reduced price spread and volume. If you look down here, you'll see the reduced price spread and volume. It only lasted a couple of days, and then off it went. And J.C. Penney moved quickly to around $33 a share. The shock, the price, stock price doubled in about 40 days. That shows you the strength of a number three spring. So that covers accumulation, the climactic action, the trading range, the spring, the ending action, the sign of strength, and the last point of support. Let's talk about distribution. Distribution is the process by which professional traders close large long positions by selling their shares to the public. The buyers are often buying on good news and they don't want to miss out on what they think will be a continued move to the upside. Like the accumulation process, stock is now moving from strong back into weak hands. The public is buying like crazy because they're seeing wonderful things are about to happen, or believe they are. An area of distribution is a trading range that prepares the stock for a strong move to the downside. It involves the elimination of those large long investment positions and short selling large blocks of stock. As the stock reaches the end of its up move, the professionals attempt to stop the move by beginning to liquidate shares of stock. Spurred on by good news and a rising stock market, the buying public, imagining great profits lie ahead, are aggressively purchasing as much stock as possible. At the same time, the professionals are liquidating their shares. The selling can be seen on the chart as both preliminary supply and a buying climax. The buying climax right here consists complete section one on the distribution chart. Often these events are preceded by a sharp advance as the stock moves into a significant overbought position relative to its upward trend channel. In layman's term, the market goes crazy on a rally. And this phenomena is known as whooping it up. If you see a long stock market, like the one, the bull market, like the one we've been in since 2009, all of a sudden go crazy. Start paying attention. It might be coming to an end. Like a selling climax. The buying climax stops the move to the upside. The climactic action is confirmed by a successful secondary test, which we have right here at number four. Once the up move is stopped, the stock begins to move sideways in a trading range. Like accumulation, both support and resistance lines are established, and these form the trading range boundaries. Again, the resistance at 2, 4, 5, 7, and 9, the support at 6, 8, and 10. Once we reach the last resistance point, we go horizontally off to the right, and the same with support horizontally off to the right. It is important to understand that the trading range will not be completely confirmed as distribution until it goes through ending action. This ending action, which will be discussed in detail, is found on section three of the distribution line chart, right here. This is an upthrust. Despite the buying climax, the trading range that follows may not be distribution at all. Just because strong hands liquidated stocks and took profits does not automatically mean they are distributing stocks in preparation for a strong move to the downside. A stock in distribution moves sideways in a defined trading range until there is the ending action that I mentioned as the upthrust. Once there is ending action, the markdown phase happens rather quickly. The stock will react hard and fast. That's why bear markets don't last nearly as long as bull markets, because panic sets in and everyone is selling. Everyone is trying to get out, get out even, or with a small loss. Distribution ending action is often comes in the form of an upthrust, but it doesn't have to. 
in distribution, in, in accumulation, we like to see the spring as the ending action. Sometimes in accumulation, or distribution rather, excuse me, in distribution, we just see the last point of the sign of, sign of weakness and a last point of supply. This particular case, we're looking at the upthrust, the secondary test, and then the reaction. So we have, excuse me, I'm just getting my stuff together. We had the upthrust, the secondary test at 13. The one thing that I really want to mention is that upthrust do not need to be tested. The supply just, everything just crashes and it goes down. So if there's an upthrust, there's not, our secondary test is not required. There is then a sign of weakness. And the sign of weakness will take you down, penetrate the support, and then rally back to the support. And we'll talk about that as we get to a couple of more stocks. And then we begin the markdown phase, which is Section 5. A stock can also react without experiencing an upthrust. But in this case of Allegiant, okay, it does. Let's take a look and let's look at Allegiant Technologies. It had a buying climax at point A, secondary test at point C, and then it began a trading range. There was an upthrust at point G. This was the ending action. It was not a classic upthrust, as supply did not come into the until the following day. However, the stock was in a needs-to-go and go-now situation. An upthrust is usually categorized as a reduction in price spread, an increase in volume, and a poor close. But when a stock reaches an accum uh, a, a resistance point, excuse me, when a stock reaches a resistance point, it needs to go and go now. If it doesn't, it's going to run into supply and it's going to react. And this is exactly what happened to Allegiant. It reacted strongly down to point M for a sign of weakness. Once again, I am not trying to show you perfect examples of wake up indicators, but rather real world examples. Because this was this supply coming in here was the beginning of the sign of weakness. And it took Allegiant Technologies to the bottom of the trading range. There it penetrated support and reached point H. The sign of weakness was also what is known as a fall through the ice. The fall through the ice is another one of the classic Bob Evans stories. It's about a man who decides he wants to take a walk on a frozen pond early in winter. Unfortunately, the ice hadn't totally frozen as he walked across the pond, and he encountered some weak ice and fell into the pond. He fell down, gathered his himself, tried to get out, swam back up to the, to the ice, but he wasn't at the hole where he fell in. Instead, he hit his head on the ice, was dazed even more, and now bad things began to happen. He'd been in the pond long enough that he was getting a little bit cold. The clothes were, his clothes were soaked, adding extra weight, and the poor man fell to the bottom of the pond. So he fell through the ice, and he ended up way down at the bottom of the pond. This is what happened with Legion Technologies. It fell through the ice at point H, rallied to point I, and down it went to point J and L. While the nimble Wyckoff trader could have taken a position when supply came into the stock after it penetrated the resistance at point G, the last point of support at point I was the real place to take a short position and positions could have been taken in the $47 area. 
Then Allegiant Technologies entered its markdown phase and reacted to point L. A review of the point and figure chart identifies the maximum objective of $33 per share. This is based on a count of 14 points taken from the sign of weakness along the $47 line. If this trade were made, the Wyckoff trader would have enjoyed a 60% profit in just over 30 days. Slumber J shows us a sign of weakness without an upthrust. This is reflected in the fact that Slumber J was unable to move through the resistance that line that was drawn from the buying, the selling, buying climax at point capital A. At point A, Slumber J completed its rally and entered into a trading range. Then, without the benefit of the upthrust, it experienced a 40-point decline. The buying climax at point A, the second, the automatic reaction and secondary test at point B, and then Schlumber J moves sideways in a trading range defined by resistance at point A and support at point C. The relatively wide price spread and volume on reactions, along with lower tops, suggested this was distribution and not accumulation. However, Schlumber J sprung the trading range at point E. Why is this in an area of distribution? And this was, wasn't this an accumulation signal? Well, you never know what's going to happen, so you've got to pay attention. But there was a legitimate spring here. With the number two spring, reacted to point E, demand came in, and it rallied strongly to point F and reacted to point G. This is a reasonable place to take a long position in the stock. So... We take position, the position could have been taken at E or it could have been taken at G. Schlumberger then rallied up to point H. Remember when I, in the last slide, when I talked about the needs to go and go now situation? Instead, at point H, Schlumberger ran into supply. It was not able to penetrate the resistance at point H. When this happens, it happens. It has to happen fast. Schlumberger needed to strongly go through point H quickly and definitively if we were going to have a significant move for the upside. It didn't do that. Instead, it reacted. Once it didn't make that move, the wake-off trader should have known that this wasn't going to play out and that they needed to take some very small profits cut their losses, and get out of Dodge. Leave, leave Schlumberger. Okay? It reacted sharply on definite supply, look at the volume, to point I. It then rallied back to the support at point J, or rallied back to the ice. Here was this last point of supply, and then Schlumberger collapsed and went to the bottom of the pond all the way down to point L. The rally back, I'm sorry. Ending action is found in both accumulation and distribution is a great way to take a position in the stock with a relatively low risk and good risk-reward ratio. It provides a structure that gives the Wyckoff student a logical reason to take new positions. Once the stock begins to move and establish in an up or down trend, it is very important to watch it closely as the trend developed. So even though we had some ending action here, it was canceled out here and we had a wonderful place to take position at point J and an ability to make a fair amount of money as Schlumberger declined. Let's talk about market trends. Market trend is a direction in which a stock or index is currently moving. These trends have trend lines that define trend boundaries and are called trend channels. There are three types of trends. Obviously, an uptrend a downtrend or a neutral trend.
But what's important about trends is they can last different periods of time. Short-term trends last from days to weeks. Medium-term trends last from weeks to months. And long-term trends last from months to years. How do we create trend lines? An uptrend is created when the low point of a second reaction is higher than the low point of the first reaction. And then, on a subsequent rally, the index or stock moves above its previous high. The line drawn between and continuing past these two lows is the support line. A parallel supply line is then drawn from the highest point of the rally between the two lows. These two trend lines create the uptrend channel. Conversely, a downtrend channel is created when the high point of the second rally is lower than the high point of the first rally. And then, on subsequent reactions, the index or stock moves below its previous low. The line drawn and continuing past the two highs is the supply line. A parallel support line is drawn from the lowest point of the reaction between the two lows. These two lines create the downtrend channel. Trends must always match your trading objectives. If you are a short-term or swing trader, you are going to pay much more attention to short-term trends. If you're a longer-term th trader, you're going to pay much more attention to medium and long-term trends. Stick with a trend that matches your objectives. And always, always, always trade with the trend. And make sure that you maintain the relationship of your stock with the trend. If the trend changes, there could be a potential problem. Let's look at some examples of trends in charts. Short-term trends are shown on a Texas Instrument chart. This chart happens to have both a short-term uptrend and a short-term downtrend. We drew the trend from point A and point C with the areas of support, and we drew that line first, and the parallel line was drawn through point B. Notice how Texas Instruments rallied nicely within the trend and then strongly rallied out of the trend and moved into an overbought position at point D. That's fine. That just shows relative strength and stronger than the trend, and that's good. I, but it is also a warning signal. It begins to say, let's see what happens on the next reaction. Well, the next reaction was okay. It rallied back, and it found support at the support line at point E. So we're still cool. Then it rallied to point F. Now uh, we are beginning to see a small problem. First of all, Text Instruments was unable to reach the trend channel supply line. On the last rally, it had been on an overbought position. It had strongly penetrated it. So there's a bit of a problem. It also ran into resistance at the same level as it did point D. What does this mean? Well, it means that looks like demand is in a little bit of trouble on this, on this trend. And look how it reacted to point G and weakened the trend. The following rally to point H broke the trend because Texas Instruments was unable to return to its short-term uptrend channel. This trend is now done. And it's pretty logical because look at all of it. This is the resistance area. And every time it reached up into this area or around the $34 level, it ran into problems. It ran into support, supply. So now it began to move sideways. We got to the end of this sideways movement. And I'm not going into the trading range situation here. Um, and then we began to, at point J, we saw a downtrend. The line was drawn at point J through L, and then the parallel support line drawn from point K. By the way, these trend lines cannot really be drawn until we find a, another new high. So the trend line, the uptrend line, was probably begin to be drawn right here as we move past the high at point B. The downtrend line was drawn in here as we move past the, the low at point K. Text instruments reacted sharply all the way down to point M. It is now in an oversold position relative to the trend. And 
we are going to see if it's going to be able to return to the trend. It'll probably begin to move sideways. And we would still hold the position, okay, unless we see a strong move to the upside. So that's a short-term downtrend, short-term uptrend. The wake-off wave is an example of an intermediate-term uptrend channel. Again, the support line is drawn from point C and E. The supply line is drawn at points D. Notice the wake-off wave, while it rallied nicely and stayed within the trend channel, it never really was aggressively rallying toward the supply line. As a matter of fact, it kind of began to roll over here, and when it reached the high at point F, and it actually slightly weakened the trend at point G. The rally to point H is really troublesome because now it's going, it's made little progress over point F, and it's going nowhere near that supply line. It is vulnerable to react. React, it did down to point I. The trend was broken at point J as the Wyckoff wave began to react off point J. Carnival is an intermediate downtrend channel. Again, we draw our supply line from point A and point G. The support line is down here at point B. I drove it up here, but it really is based on the low at point B. Carnival stayed very nicely within the trend channel until it began, until it was unable to reach that line at point D. And then when it moved over here, it really was unable to reach the support line at it simply held it held about halfway down the trend channel and was unable to come and test this support line this is troublesome and it obviously rallied through weakened the trend strongly at e broke it at f when you see this happening when it is unable to reach a particular supply or support line in this case the, supp the support line this is problems it also, an early clue was given when it rallied here and weakened the line right up here where my, my cursor is. So we are beginning to say this is probably the end of a trend. If we've had a position, it's probably time to check the objectives to see if it's reached objectives, and it may be time to close our trade and get out. Long-term uptrend. Yum Brands is an example of a long-term uptrend. It went through a trading range. It went through reaccumulation, and it just kept going. And it went all the way to point Y, where it ran into a little bit of trouble and has reacted out. If you are a long-term trader, even though it was in a overbought and oversold positions, and the oversold positions became a little more noticeable. I'm really going to pay a lot of attention to my point and figure chart and look at my objectives before I begin to make it make a decision on this. If I'm a long-term trader, I'm pretty much of a buy and hold trader and I want to see a specific reason for me to get out of a particular stock. So I would rely heavily on my point and figure chart if I am a long-term trader. Long-term downtrend from Alcoa is roughly the same way. Okay, the, the, the trend channel is drawn from A to C. The support line is drawn with point B. It comes down, it weakens it point at point E. It now is moving sideways. I'm beginning to see a sideways movement. It breaks, it weakens the channel at point H, and obviously the channel is broken as Alcoa wanders sideways. As you have seen, regardless of the trend's duration, when a stock is advancing and meets resistance or selling, it must either overcome that resistance or it will react. Naturally, the same is true when a stock is declining and meets support or buying. It will either drive through the support or reverse direction and begin to rally. These turning points are critical moments and provide excellent places for successful entry and exit points. Trends are one of the most important market indicators. A core Wyckoff rule is to always trade in harmony with the existing trend. And once a position is taken, it is critical to pay attention to the trend. 
As long as the market action keeps the stock within that trend channel, the position is secure and we can continue to accumulate profits. It's when the stock weakens or penetrates the trend lines and moves into an overbought or oversold position relative to that trend channel that we must increase our awareness and be prepared to act. Now the Wyckoff student can get ready to take a position in the market. But the first step in establishing is establishing the position of each stock. And this is done using the position sheet. I want to go back to, to trends again. As we go back to these trends, did you notice how the trends began to give us little early warning signals as to things were going to change, that things were going to happen? That was kind of the message I was trying to communicate to you. In other words, you don't have to wait until the trend is broken to figure out that it's, it's over. It's important to look at the stock, look at how it's behaving as it approaches support lines or supply lines in trend channels, and that can give us some early indicators, not necessarily action indicators, but early indicators as to what might be happening in the future. Let me go back to the position sheets again, please. The position sheet is a helpful method to identify and organize market trends before taking to or new or adding to existing positions. It allows Wyckoff students to analyze several stocks along with the related group leadership stock. The stock's short and long-term positions are determined and placed on the position sheet. Before taking a new position, it's extremely important for the Wyckoff student to determine the stock's specific position and if is it in, if it is in sync with the goals and objectives of that particular trade. Positions are categorized as follow. Position one indicates the stock is in a short-term uptrend. Position two indicates the stock is in a long-term uptrend. Position three indicates the stock is in a short-term downtrend. Position four indicates the stock is in a long-term downtrend. Here's an example of the position sheet. Each Wyckoff wave stock is a leader in a specific industry group. And each Wyckoff wave stock, there is only one, one stock for each industry group of the 12 industry groups that we follow. Boeing, for example, is the leader in the aerospace group. Caterpillar is the leader in the equipment. Ford Automotive, Bank of America Financial, and so on. Therefore, as I begin to identify candidates, I look for the strongest groups and then the strongest stocks within that particular group. This is where the group leadership stocks come into play. But if you're not moving using the Wyckoff wave, you can compare the group leadership stocks to your existing market industry to try to find the strongest groups. A stock can be in position one and position two or position three and position four at the same time. It can also be in position one and position four or position three and position two. If a stock is in a neutral trend, no mark is made on the position sheets. Now we need to drill down and find the best candidates in which to take a position and some sort of a structure that helps us determine that we can make a buying or short selling decision. I believe in buying tests and selling tests. Buying tests tell us where to take a long position and we can look for the end of accumulation trading range on a spring, a secondary test or a last point of support or it can help us take positions during an uptrend on a successful test of a trend channel's supply line. Buying tests are as follows, and they're simply a sheet of paper that you can write down, and it's important to manually do this, to put it down on a piece of paper, not think and leave it in your head, because it, your mind can play weird tricks on you. And if you don't write it down, you don't have any really any discipline, that's the word I wanted to try to find, any discipline to maintain your market plan. So we want to make sure the objective is accomplished to the downside. 
that we've run into preliminary support or a selling climax, that a base is forming, a downtrend is broken, activity is bullish, volume is increasing on rally, showing demand, decreasing on reactions, showing that supply is beginning to dry up. We are seeing ending action in a spring, secondary test, or a last point of support. Let's take a look at Adobe and apply our buying test to Adobe. And again, I'm using a real world chart so everything isn't exactly perfect. Objective accomplished to the downside. Well, let's find out. While it all isn't on the vertical line chart, and point A is not on the vertical line chart, Adobe went into distribution from point A, climatic action at point A, over to a last point of supply at point B. I believe there is a count here of 10 points, which gives us an objective, because Adobe is trading at $32 a share, gives us objectives of $22 to $25 a share. On the point and figure chart, you always take an objective range, which ranges from the top of the trading range to the point that you took the position. So we had a range here between 32 and 35 with objectives of between $25 and $22 a share. So good news. We have object objectives were accomplished to the downside. We, had, we did not have a preliminary support, but that's okay. It's not mandatory. But we certainly did have a buying climax at point E and a secondary test at point F. Just hung in there and hung slightly above Adobe at point, the selling climax at point E. We then went into a trading range, and we see how we had our resistance lines and our support lines. The base is definitely forming. But is the downtrend broken? No, it's not. Problem, okay, we can't turn around and take a position on this spring at point G, even though good demand came into the market. Because there's an old Wyckoff rule that was formulated by this wonderful Mr. Evans, God rest his soul, who said, beware of springs in a downtrend. If you take a position, an uptrend in on the spring here at point G, you are trading against the trend. You are taking a long position right in the middle of a downtrend. Bad idea. Why you, in this case, you would have gotten away with it. More often than not, you will be disappointed and you will, be, you will lose money. So let's see what happens. Let's develop this a little bit. Okay? We have ending action in the spring. We have everything that we... Our buying tests are almost complete except for the downtrend. So we rally to point I. We come back and test at point J. Point J is a last point of support. It is also confirming the downtrend is broken. We can now rally to point K. We come down to point L, down to point M. There's probably a last point of support here and then off we go in the markup phase. So once we reached point J, we were able to confirm that our buying test had been completed, and we could check all these boxes off and take a position to the upside. Now, there's something else that I want to talk about here. Adobe if you take a, a point at the secondary test, the last point of support, excuse me, okay, we had a count of 5, 10, 14 points. We had objectives of between 39 and $36 a share. Adobe at point O reached $35 a share. It then went through more reaccumulation and rallied all the way up into the 50s and 60s. You'll notice here that this is point O. This is our first objective. Okay, this is the objective that we got from here over to here. This would not have been, even though Adobe went higher, this would not have been a bad place to close the position because we've also broken our trend channel. 
I would probably close the position. I might, no, I'm not going to throw Adobe away. I'm going to watch again. And I might look to take a position somewhere in here as it began to develop. But I'm not going to sit there and wait all this time for Adobe to, which is almost a year, um, for Adobe to, to move sideways. And then I will take another count and I will go. That's why I wanted to show you this. And that's why I would close the, the trade out at point capital O when I made the objective. Now let's talk about selling tests. Was the preliminary objective accomplished to the upside? Did we have preliminary support and a buying climax? Was a crown forming? Was an uptrend broken? Was activity bearish? And did we, do we have ending action? It's basically the same thing as the buying test and kept in reverse. So let's take a look at Caterpillar. Was the objective accomplished to the upside? Because we're looking at Caterpillar as a, for a down move. Well, let's take a look. Okay, Caterpillar at point A went through a, buy, a selling climax, okay, and a last point of support at point G. We have a fairly large count of 4, 9, 14, 19, 23, 24 points from point G all the way up. This gave us a maximum objective of $93 a share. The phase the phase, each phase is a, its own individual count, and they are separated by something noticeable, like this wide gap between the two phases. When I take a count on a point and figure chart, I look for the lowest objectives first. Then I take a look and see how the stock is behaving as it reaches that initial objective, and that helps me determine if I want to close out or maintain my position. In this particular case, Adobe did reach its objective at point H at $79 a share. So we have that to fill out. We have preliminary support and we have a selling climax, we have a crown forming, we have resistance and support, we have the activity is bearish, look at the lower tops that we have coming in here and look especially here at M, look at the low volume and the reduced price spread as demand is definitely drying up and then boom at M, supply comes in and we have a reaction to point N. So the activity has been bearish, we had ending action, and it's legitimate to give us a buy signal or sell signal, short sell sort signal at point O. If we take a look at it and we take a count from H over to point O, we have an objective of $64 a share. Adobe reached $63 a share at point V right here. It is in a definitively oversold position relative to its trend channel, it's probably time to close the trade, take the profits, and get out of the market. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about Wyckoff trading guidelines. Some of this I'm repeating, but if it's on this chart, it's really, really, really important, and it's it, pay attention. Please determine the short, intermediate, and long-term trends of the market, regardless of whether you are a short, intermediate, or long-term trader. You care a lot about what the market is doing as an intermediate or long-term trader, even if you are a short-term trader. Decide the type of trade, whether short, medium, or long-term, you wish to make. Then focus on that particular trend. While you need to know what's going on in the other two trends, you need to focus on the particular trend that you have. Determine the relative strength or weakness of the group leadership stocks 
compared to your market index. Identify the strongest stocks within your selected group compared with the related group leadership stock. Use the Wyckoff position sheet and the buying and selling tests to find the best stocks. Then look for the Wyckoff indicators to time your trade. Now, before placing your order, remove emotions. On paper, write down your specific Wyckoff indicator or indicators that caused you to act. Write down the goal of the stock based on its point and figure chart. Write down where you are going to place your stop order and a specific reason for that decision. Write down exactly what you expect the stock to do immediately after you place the order. Write down what the stock would do that would make you close your position. And every day, write down a brief synopsis, synopsis of the stock's performance and if it's proceeding according to plan. The key word there is write down. I used to not write things down. I would sit there and make a mental decision, and I would say, oh, it's based on this, and I've got this, and I've got a spring, and I've got a last point of support, and I'm going to take position here. But, I'm, but then all of a sudden something would happen that I didn't really expect, and then I emotionally would begin to justify what I had originally said. Because it wasn't written down, it was up in the air, so I could do that. I lost the money that way and learned a lesson the hard way. So now I write down. It's a pain, but I write down every time I am going to buy a stock, what I'm going to do, why I'm going to do it, what I expect to do, and what I would do if something happens that's different. I always, 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 always use a stop order. Never, ever make a trade unless you can logically and safely use a stop order. Make sure you move stop orders to present protect profits. And I think the most important thing about stop orders is don't use them because you don't need to wait to be stopped out of a bad trade. Back that you've written stuff down, you, th you see things are going back, you bad, you've got some early warning signals, get out. Get out and don't let the stop order take you out. Be out first. You'll save a lot of money that way. Some final thoughts, and I know we're running a little late, and I apologize for keeping you here. But if your trade is not behaving as expected, just like I just said, don't wait for the stop. Close the position. Move on. I spent a lot of time and a lot of money wishing and hoping. Believe me, it's an expensive endeavor. Look at the stock from a longer-term perspective and try to identify its unique characteristics. Believe it or not, stocks are unique. Before I look at a short-term trade, if I wish to say swing trading, I would go back and look at the stock over a period of time, over a longer term period. I want to know how it behaves when it reaches trend lines. I want to know what it does when it, when it springs. I want to know what kind of how it handles when it reaches resistance and support. Because if it did it back six months ago or a year ago or two years ago, it'll probably do it tomorrow. So I want to get a feel for this stock. I want to understand this stock. Always use relative strength and weakness analysis, the position and the sheets and the buying and selling tests. And I know this is the fourth or fifth time it appears here, but write a daily review. And as the move progresses, always include your stop order in your daily review. When the stop order is moved, note the new price, justify the move, and say what you're going to do next. As soon as possible, draw the trend channel on your vertical line chart. This is really important because those trend channels and how a stock reacts when it, not reacts, but acts when it reaches a supply or a support line can give you some early signals as to what's really happening in the world. When a stock reaches out, reaches its objective area, write down the scenarios that will cause you to close your position. If one plays out, close the position and take profits. Again, write them down. What's going to make you sell that stock? Quite honestly, it's very simple. If it meets the objective area, okay, and it's behaving no matter what, get out of the stock because that's what you said you wanted to get. Don't be greedy. Oinky, oinky, oinky costs money, money, money. You don't need to buy at the exact bottom or sell at the exact top. Getting between 90% and 95% of the total move is always a great trade. Finally. The biggest 
most important thing you can do in the stock market is, and it's like in, in my small business the same way, it's not how much money you make, it's how much money you don't lose. Remember, you are going to make mistakes. You are going to make bad trades. Lord knows I've made enough of them. But remember, a baseball player is in the Hall of Fame if he fails 7 out of 10 times. If you are successful 50% of the time and you use great stop orders and cut your losses and keep your losses low, you will be a very successful person in the stock market. Finally, I would just like to close. This seminar or webinar has been an overview of my ebook, Wyckoff Strategies and Techniques, Finding and Trading Winning Stocks. The book normally sells for $195. For this webinar, we are offering a 30% sale, and you can purchase it for $136. All you need to do is go to WyckoffStockMarketInstitute.com, click on Updated Wyckoff Course, and then when you are in your shopping cart, use your redemption code 30 off, lowercase, and you will automatically receive the book for $136. In addition to downloading the ebook, you will also receive an audio, an MP3 file that you can play on your computer, and a separate set of charts that will allow you to listen to the book and look at the charts as we go through it. I was talking to my friends over at Wyckoff SMI and telling them I was doing this seminar. We are not associated at all with Wyckoff SMI. They are the charting service company. We are the training company, but we have no relationship at all. And they said they'd be happy to offer a 10% discount from the Wyckoff Pulse of the Market Charting Service if you signed up for it at WyckoffSMI.com. Simply use code 10OFFGYM, again, all lowercase. Well, that concludes my seminar, and I'm glad because I'm tired. And I hope you enjoyed it. I really had a lot of fun doing this. I apologize for my bumbles and my stumbles. I'm not a pro at this. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. If not, and you have them later, feel free to log on to our forum at WyckoffStockMarketInstitute.com, and I'd be happy to ask them there. Uh, Jim, we have a question from uh, Wayne. Um, when you reference price spread, is it true that you're basing that on the daily or other time frame high to low range or open versus closed spread? High to low range. Um, the, the point is that we do not, Wyckoff does not look at gap openings or at all. In other words, if I am looking at a, if, if yesterday's price spread was, say, 50 cents on a stock, stock between the high and the low, and the high and the low, and there was a gap opening, okay, and it went up, and it went up 75 cents, but the gap opening was 40 cents. I'm only going to look at the 35 cents that I saw that, that is on the chart that was actually traded. Does that answer the question? I think, yeah. And David asks, uh, the horizontal channel is easy to see after the fact, as most things are. Uh, at what point is the horizontal channel drawn? Does it have to reach a point nine top and a point ten bottom? Let me... You're talking about trend lines here, right? Uh, the horizontal channels. Oh, the trend, the trend channels. Mm -hmm. When are you talking about trend channels or 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 um, trading ranges? I'm sorry, I'm not doing well here. Yeah, you know, the the trading range. Yeah, that's the trading, it right there. Right yeah, here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I'm sorry. Could, could you give me the question again, please? Yeah, it says the horizontal channel is easy uh, to see after the fact. At what point is a horizontal channel drawn? Does okay. it have to reach a point nine top and point ten bottom? Okay, good question. Okay, what I do is the second I see a a buying climax or a, a selling climax, that's where I I've got my first point. Okay, when it comes down and tests again, I've got my second point, so I draw the line to here to here. Then I just wait for the for the stock to tell me what it's going to be doing. But a lot of times, and the same thing here. With the, with the resistance line, 
Okay, I'll start at the automatic rally, and then I'll continue as it, as it reaches the resistance area and reaches the resistance area. I'll just continue to connect, connect those lines. Now, um, what do I want to say here? I'm I'm losing my train of thought because I'm old. <laughs> but uh, but so so I think that that covers. And then you draw once you reach your last resistance point, you draw the line straight out. Once you reach the last support point, you draw the line straight out. And that's when you would see, for example, in this case, the spring. Um, I know what I was going to say. A lot of times when you're looking at a stock, you're not necessarily looking at the stock the day you saw the selling climax. You're looking at the stock a few weeks later. The trading range has already begun to develop. I found that's, that was a lot of case. I was poking around. I'm looking for springs. So I'm going back, and I said, oh, there's, here's, here's a stock that had a great selling climax. It's got a nice little trading range. I'm going to watch this. So then I start filling in, okay, all of my little lines. And so a lot of times my support and resistance lines are drawn after the fact because, they, they, because I'm going back and looking at, at earlier history. Then I, will, then I will continue to draw them as they begin to reach those areas of support. For example, I'll go make it even more complicated. Let's say, for example, if this went down to 10 and there wasn't a spring, it kind of came back up. Then I would go, oops, back down here. I draw my, my, draw my line down to here, and I continue the trading range. This happens a lot. A lot of times you look at something, it's not a spring. No, it kind of wandered up on very, very poor demand. The key to a spring is having strong demand come into the market. It is definitive. It is solid. It is, look at me. I'm coming at you. Okay? If that doesn't happen, we just had another support point on the trading range. Have I exhausted you all on that? <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. Uh, Jim, uh, Bill asks, uh, how did Wyckoff handle the 1929 crash? He called it. Believe it or not, Wyckoff was... In, in the late 20s, Wyckoff was in poor health and was actually had gone to the French Riviera. He, was, he made millions of dollars in the stock market and was vacationing on the French Riviera, and he was kind of following the market, and he realized that the market was in big trouble. There was going to be a major crash. He called his friends, begged them to get out of the market. Those that listened were very grateful. Those that didn't, sometimes some of them jumped off buildings. And then, interestingly enough, not only did Wyckoff call the crash of 29, he also called the bottom of the depression on, on the New York Times index, which was the current index of the day. He called it within a couple of points. So he did a pretty good he, – he called, he called, the, um, he called the, the, the crash of 29, and he called how far it was going to go down. Pretty neat stuff. Yeah. And then Jim uh, Redu asks, uh, is it necessary to use Elliott wave theory in order to practice Wyckoff trading techniques? No, it's not. Uh, again, I, I have nothing bad to say about anything, but I'm a Wyckoff purist. I've never used, I couldn't tell you any more about Elliott wave than its name. I don't know anything about Elliott wave. I've never used it in 46 years. Now, that's not saying it's, it's not terrific. I'm, I have no, no qualms with Elliott Wave. I'm just a Wyckoff purist. I believe in Wyckoff, and I don't believe in combining Wyckoff with anything else. But that's me. And that looks like that's uh, the uh, end of the questions. Oh, thank you. I'm glad. <laughs> um, okay, well, thanks, any, Jim. <laughs> if there are any questions, please feel free to go to the forum and ask them, and I'll try to answer them there for you. And thank you so very much for allowing me to, to participate in this webinar. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, um, and thanks for sharing the uh, Wyckoff overview with us. Uh, I want to mention, by the way, this it was uh, Jim's first webinar. So uh, well done, Jim. <laughs> well, at, at 74, it might be my last, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think uh, Wyckoff is a, a useful way to see the market. Um, how long does it take? to complete the entire course, let's say uh, if someone was just starting out without any trading knowledge, how long would it take them to go through uh, and understand uh, the entire Wyckoff uh, course? 
including the practice trading, took me about six months. But I was also employed at the time, and so I wasn't I wasn't doing this full time. Right. Um, if I can if I can put in a horrible plug, what I would probably do is I would buy my book, which is a an an updated version of the strategy and techniques, but it doesn't take nearly as long to read. And then you can determine, and that gives you pretty much bite wake off a lot of wake off concepts. You can read that in a, in a, in a week or so and then do some practice trading and see if those concepts are working for you before I would go mm -hmm. and, and spend a lot more time doing stuff. That's, you know, that's helpful to people. Um, Gene snuck a question in here. Uh, can you use it on all time frames? Yes. Yes. I have, I have done day trading and I have done, and I'm, I am, I am a, I was, a, I was mostly a swing trader when I traded. I am now a buy and a long-term trader because I'm old and I, don't, I want to preserve my capital. But uh, I have I have tra day traded with Wyckoff. I have swing traded with Wyckoff, and I have long-term traded with Wyckoff. Tom says, "Good job, way to go." <laughs> Thank you, Tom. You made my day. I really appreciate it. <laughs> you know, uh, sometime in the future, um, Jim, would you uh, think about coming back and? Uh, Maybe talk about uh, Wyckoff targeting techniques uh, using point figure and maybe some advanced topics. I'd be happy to. I've got you on a list then. We'll be talking. I'm in, right? <laughs> yeah, you're in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and just a quick note on upcoming speakers. Uh, we now have guests scheduled uh, every other week into November. Uh, as soon as we have uh, settled on the topics, uh, we will post the uh, future webinars on the site. Uh, DenverTradingGroup.com. Our next guest will be Corey Rosenblum. Uh, Corey will present intraday trading tactics, de uh, determining day structure and how to trade it. Uh, the date of that webinar is Thursday, September 7th. Um, thanks again, Jim. Uh, okay. and we'll, we'll be talking to you in the future. Looking uh, forward to it, and thank you for inviting me. I, was, I really enjoyed myself. It was a great afternoon. Yeah, it was good. So on behalf of the DTG, this is Ron. Uh, have a great rest of your day, and take care, everyone.